Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And as we have been doing through September, every Thursday, we are covering performing arts organizations, issues, and leaders. And today, we will be discussing the future of performing arts organizations with special guests, Lori Diamond, President and CEO of the Harris Theater in Millennium Park, Chicago, Rachel Fine, Executive Director and CEO of the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Los Angeles, California, and Elizabeth Sobel, President and CEO of the Saratoga Performing Arts Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. We're so pleased to have you all. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to go over to you, Lori, uh, but let me set you uh, set this up by saying that your performing arts organizations all gather people together to enjoy music, dance, theater, other performances. And my goodness, what a challenging environment this has been. We haven't been able to gather together during the pandemic. So let's talk a little bit about what you've experienced and how, Lori, you are coming out of this pandemic and what kind of changes it's actually wrought. And then we're going to go around the table and then we're going to deal with some, some other issues. Lori? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Well, <laughs> it's been a ride. It's been an adventure. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way to put it. And I, I sit here today now having navigated a year of what would be actual live in-person performance again. And I, I think I sit here obviously feeling very optimistic and and Chicago is a community that celebrates arts and culture and we're seeing people come back maybe not where they were pre-pandemic but we're really starting to see audiences come back the artists here in Chicago have brought forth this past year the most incredible programming um, we've been able to welcome back 17 of our 28 uh, resident companies at the Harris this past year and um, are already seeing 25 of those 28 coming back this this next year. And so we're starting to really see companies get their feet un underneath them and, and really feeling a little bit more security and stability um, as we venture into this next season. But there's there's still a lot of hurdles ahead of us. I think our team, um, while we went through plans A, B, C, D, E, F, and G last year, I think we're really hoping that we can manage those hurdles maybe with A, B, C, and D plans. Um, now that we've been through so much this past year, but we're, we're feeling really optimistic going into this coming season ahead. And as we travel around the country, uh, Rachel, we're finding that the audiences that are returning are not all returning at the same time. So we're finding that the younger audiences are returning first. The older audiences are, are, um, are coming back with a little bit more hesitancy. Um, so the audience mix has actually adjusted. Are you finding that that's the case um, over in Los Angeles, or are you finding that your audiences are returning at pretty much the same rate for every audience cohort, whether it's age or defined by other uh, attributes? No, the audiences are definitely not returning uh, in the way that they were pre-pandemic. So March of 2020, I think we're seeing very, very different patterns among all different constituents. And I think there are a lot of factors from how confident do you feel in an indoor space to are you willing to wear a mask? We are still mandating masks and vaccinations in our venue. And there are a lot of people who think, understandably, who are very tired of wearing masks. Um, so I think it's a it's many, many different factors from the programming that we're putting on stage and what is actually going to draw people out because they're not coming out with the same frequency to how comfortable do they feel in the space. So no, we're seeing very, very different patterns. And um, I think at this point, we just need to have a good sense of humor. You know, we, we spent lots of time and effort and money and investment on um, marketing data, you know, mining marketing data, and it's just all gone out the window. You know, five years of um, working very hard to better understand our audiences. And uh, we've just had to put that aside and, you know, now look at, I mean, we're spending a lot of time with the audience outlook monitor. I'm sure you're all following that as well. Um, but it's, it is changing every single month. And so, you know, we don't, we're, we're just like everyone else um, in terms of what we're saying. But I, I, I don't know that it's as age specific. We definitely have older audiences that are coming out. And again, it really depends. We have a Motown show that is um, opening our season on October 1st. Um, it is completely sold out and it's definitely an older demographic, completely sold out in a matter of days. That's, that's really interesting. And, and Elizabeth, in Saratoga Springs, 
you have a completely different environment than a, than a major uh, urban uh, centralized environment. People are coming from around the uh, around the region and and to the region. Um, does gas do gas prices also affect uh, what you're experiencing? I mean, you you have the mask fatigue. I'm sure it's it, it's true for every part of the country. How are you uh, faring, and and what are your audiences like, and and how are these various factors affecting you? Yeah, it's uh, like the same that it, there are these wide fluctuations, not necessarily based on discernible trends. Um, so just to give you kind of a quick overview, like we are in upstate New York, so we're not in an urban center. It's a city of about 30,000 and a region, the capital region of upstate New York of between 500,000 and a million, depending on what you're counting. Um, we for the most part, have been masks off. Even last year, the the governor released all restrictions going mm-hmm. into our the main part of our season. So we were masks optional um, in the uh, for the audience. The backstage still continues to be masked, but we're our main residencies are Jazz Fest at the end of June, a week of New York City Ballet in July, and then three weeks of uh, Philadelphia Orchestra in August, and then a whole series of Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center across the um, six different performances across the summer, all of it outdoors. We moved the chamber music outdoors and sort of uh, jazz fest. We were seriously down. Uh, We only hit 70% of target. That is a very mixed audience. It's the most diverse audience. We have um, 50% out of towners as opposed to orchestra and ballet being about 85% local so we definitely think gas prices fit into that scenario. Um, we're a big destination location for weddings and events and everything. Hotel prices skyrocketed this year. Um, <clears throat> Saratoga is also the home to the Saratoga race course, which is the oldest um, thoroughbred horse racing in the country. And so for those seven weeks, hotel prices are just through the roof. So we think that affected attendance some. Ballet, we were pretty much flat year over year from from uh, from 19 and then the orchestra went gangbusters 114 percent of target oh and that's then, interesting so yeah. so so uh orchestra classical music i guess yeah right? so that- i think there's a couple of things and I, before i forget i do want to mention that you were also a live nation house so we had 33 live nation shows believe it or not those tend to be older demographics like you've got 80 year old, I had a hundred year old woman coming to Rod Stewart, like literally, and those shows were packed. We had capacity audiences for particularly the country shows because of you know our location and everything. People did not seem worried about being with 18 to 25,000 of their nearest and dearest friends. So I, I think, um, with orchestra, once, yeah, sorry. We the were once very, in a lifetime experience seems to be, you know, if you're a hundred years old and Rod Stewart's playing, that might be the last time you get to see him. And I think we are seeing that too, you know, someone who might not perform frequently in Los Angeles or is a megastar, um, people of all ages, stripes are coming out. Yeah. How do you, how do you forecast given the, because you just said a couple of things that to me were, were really surprising. So the classical music piece, 114% um, oversubscribed, where uh, other performances are undersubscribed, ballet. We were the opposite. You're you're the opposite. We were the exact opposite. Talk talk about that, uh, Lori. Yeah, when you said that, that was really striking to me because you know I do think based on our location, there there's a large saturation of classical music. Um, right. Our most successful programs this past year were a lot of new works, new music, new new composition. Um, e- even on our jazz series, we had a couple of really great rising stars. And those were our fastest selling and highest selling engagements. Whereas some of our more classical music ones that we we actually were kind of anchoring those in our season were much more difficult to sell. So it's it was interesting that that was almost exactly opposite to what you your audience was experiencing. Well, That's so really- I, yeah, I mean, if I may, like just just to sort of highlight because the orchestra season was very different than any orchestra season we've ever had. It was a, a really diverse season. And um, we did try some cross promotion of having artists like, for instance, Lettucey, um was on one of the closers on our Sunday Jazz Fest. 
she also was doing the music of Nina Simone with the Philadelphia Orchestra. So when we announced the orchestra show the day she performed, we had a ton of people buy tickets for that Philadelphia Orchestra show. Um, but it was an incredibly diverse um you know, BIPOC artists, women, composers, choreographers. I'll give you one example to our opening night normally is something along the lines of a festive fireworks and a, or Tchaikovsky spectacular sort of usual opening night with fireworks. And this year, particularly as we were planning, the, the, the war in Ukraine was breaking out. We did not want to do the 1812 overture and much less have cannons and reenactors and everything. So we ditched that and put in its place um, a new work choreographed by Tyler Peck on Ballet X, who were based in Philadelphia, and um, with music by Valerie Coleman, um, Emoja, the anthem for unity. And so it was completely switched up using the, our traditions, but with different content. And people really responded to it. Like we've been, you know, not sure how much new material, new artists, young up and comers to bring to the table, uh, thinking that they kind of wanted that steady diet of Yo-Yo Ma and Joshua Bell. Oh, young, young audiences want, right? I mean, Rachel, yeah. don't young audiences want the new? Uh, don't they demand it? Uh, one of the things that I've, that I've been looking at, I've been, I've been having discussions with, uh, with jazz and blues presenting organizations all over the country. And if you just take a look at the artists, they are young, they are diverse, they are, uh, you know, the musical, the music that is presented is just all over the place. And it's it, it's fabulous. And, and basically, the traditional side is not, if there's too much of it, you won't attract those those young audiences. Rachel, what are you finding in terms of your audience taste? Are you finding demand for the new? Or are you defining more comfort with the traditional? I mean, again, I don't think it can be sort of isolated into new or traditional. Um, I think there's so many factors at play, including who the artist is. So that's a major, major draw um, or not. Um, I think um, I'm trying to think what else, but there, there's so many different factors, you know, what we have so much content to in Los Angeles. So, you know, what's the competition and who's playing what and where and when um, is it indoor? Is it outdoor? Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, for, you know, for me, it's, it's new versus traditional. I think there are just so many factors at play and um, you know, we're making it up as we go along, you know, as we see patterns, we're trying to do, you know, new things and um, attract people um, with a variety of different measures. Um, I think for younger audiences though, and I know, you know, this, we've heard this many, many, many times about the immersive experience, but I think that that is really true that a lot of the younger audiences are not interested in coming in and seeing things in a tra traditional format, you know, first half intermission, second half, sitting in your seat the whole time, no drink, you know? And I think um, where we've really seen a lot of younger audiences is when we, um, when we, when it's more than just that, when it's more than just the, what I just described. So um, for some of our artists, we have, you know, not during COVID, but before COVID, we were seeing huge response to having drinks in the theater, which of course, <laughs> you know, when you, when, you know, for, for someone of my age and generation, that was just totally taboo. So uh, now, you know, along with Broadway, you know, drinks at your seat. I mean, it's just, it's just expected. Are you finding that you have to deal with physical space changes and and changes to the traditional uh, theater experience that basically change um, the what what's going on not on stage, but what is going on in terms of of how you treat, how you greet, how you interact with your with your audiences? I see Elizabeth, uh, you're nodding, but you know th this whole idea um, of sitting in a small seat for you know, an hour um, with with your legs sort of pulled up against you and, and you know, sort of in that in that small confined space, the young the young audience is just not tolerant uh, of that kind of thing anymore. Elizabeth, how how do you deal with the fact that you have a built environment that yeah. those seats are actually fixed and installed? How do, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's something even, you know, it's we can't change the actual seating, obviously. But one of the things that we found ourselves doing for the first time ever, particularly during the orchestra, is 
instructing our ushers on their guidelines in a different way. So for instance, where we knew we were trying to bring in a new audience, whether it was Lettucey bringing in the jazz audience and a more diverse audience or our film nights where we're bringing in kids from all over the capital region, you cannot impose the same kind of strict classical music etiquette on audiences if you wanna grow a new audience for the future. And I'll never forget my first uh, festival managers meeting after I had, you know, left the, you know, talent agency and record company world and moved to my first, you know, foray here in Saratoga, running a not-for-profit and sat down with my colleagues and we were talking about churn ticket sales and growing the audience. And I said, what, what do you guys consider the biggest challenge to um, bringing in new audience? And they all said the glare factor. And I said, what in the world is the glare factor? And they said that when those new audiences come in and they do not exhibit accepted etiquettes, people turn around and glare at them and they will never come back. You mm -hmm. know, and I think that's something we all have to be very, very cognizant of every night because we all know that coming to a particularly a classical concert, but even when just the Philadelphia Orchestra with you know, a pop or rock artist or a film night, these are like walking, like reading hieroglyphs, you know, reading a program for an orchestra program is like reading hieroglyphs. And we all have to remember that we've luckily grown up with a kind of inherited or learned or educated, you know, behavior on how to do this. But like most of the world don't anymore because they're not going to those concerts as part of their normal experience. So Lori, are you competing in a certain respect with the Chicago White Sox? Are you competing for that audience? I, I'm, I'm really serious. In other words, if, if you take Elizabeth's point about the glare factor, right, you're not wearing the proper thing. You're not you're not uh, dealing with accepted etiquette. But a huge portion of your audience, while they're interested in the arts experience, they, they completely don't care about those traditional points of etiquette that that Elizabeth was talking about. Are you competing for those for those uh, butts and seats? White, maybe not White Sox. Uh, <laughs> no, um, no, absolutely. We absolutely are, especially as we look to it. And Rachel, you kind of alluded to this too about this intergenerational audience or a mixed generation audience. I do think a lot of the programming that we are doing is geared towards, you know, bring the whole family and make it experience and really trying to draw in audiences that are, again, cross generations. Um, I, I do find one thing that has been really interesting for us. Um, and again, with some of these programs that are really highly successful, and I'd love to say it's all our marketing, but mm -hmm. social media has played a huge role. When we're programming artists that have, they themselves have huge followings, we're seeing a lot of their pushing out to their fans the excitement around coming to Chicago, what that experience is going to be. And I think we've been able to work with artists to kind of curate the purchase path, but also what the experience is going to be when they walk in the door. Because if, even if we have an artist behind, you know, backstage that's, that's sending pictures that make it feel like they're comfortable or they're, they're at home at the Harris, then your audience is going to feel that that kind of same energy, and we've seen some really great, um, some great kind of cross marketing efforts between the artists and then us. And then what it's also helped us to do is think about what is it like when audience walk through our front doors. And we've had more and more artists, and I, I'm interested if you've had this as well, that are that are interested in you know, are you do you have a playlist? What music is playing when your audience comes in? What are you serving at the bar? What are the concessions? Because some some of this, especially younger generation, what artists, am I going to experience before yeah, I actually get there? They want to know. You know, we we had Samara Joy, who's this young, amazing, amazing um, jazz vocalist, and she she was so curious about who was going to come to her performance and what that experience is going to be, and, and she asked such great questions that it, you know led our team to also ensure that her audience was going to feel. And oh, my God, you know, I, I, I would go in when we were doing searches and I would say, you know, use social media, let let the artists um, sort of uh, open up what was going on in their lives. Right. Have them bring their audience. And, and I was greeted with real rejection. But things are changing now. Right. Because 
because uh, centers like yours, Rachel, they need that kind of collaboration that that Lori just described, right? Oh, absolutely. I also think it's not just before, it's after. So instead of making people wait outside of the green room, um, so many of our artists just come out and have drinks at the bar afterwards. And that is an extension of the performance and the experience in the community building. And we love that if the artist, you know, whether it's a string quartet or a rock band, that they're going to come out and mingle with everyone and that they're approachable. Um, but just going back to Let Us See, um, because we did the same show, we did this, the Nina Simone show. And, you know, not everybody has a black box theater, but instead of, having a traditional seating arrangement, which we can do in our black box, we set it up as a nightclub. And um, I think so many of those, you know, that those um, like the expected etiquette just went out the window, you know, or traditional etiquette, I should say. Um, there was definitely etiquette, but, um, you know, it just made for a very, very, whether it was the lighting, the seating, the drinks, the audience interaction. And I think the invitation by the singer, by Lettucey to, you know, stand up, you know, be a part of this with me, that energy. Um, so again, I know I realize not everybody can just change the format, um, you know, of their seating or their space, but we've also put a lot of audience members on our stage, which is, you know, it's nothing new, but I think when you pay a premium price to be on stage with the artists, it's just, it's really magical and talk about immersive you're in the center of it all and then your people have to start reconfiguring their own thought processes their own workflows their interactions with the audience so the so the relationship between the administrative side of your operations and the art side those barriers start to uh, also dissolve don't they um in, in terms of elizabeth how how you're and, and and Lori, um, in terms of how you're interacting on the administrative side, you know, traditionally you had people's in in offices and people who were in rehearsal rooms and on the stage and all over the place, right, preparing to present their art, but the actual workspace was the actual stage. Now you actually have to interact in a different way, and also your education piece is going to be different. How, how do you see that shifting and, and how are you preparing for a continued embrace of these new ways of operating in buildings that were built, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? How do you deal with that? Well, on to, so that those were a couple of, I think those were a couple of questions and, and big ones um, to go back to the audience. For one thing, we've really tried to flatten our, staffing so that really everybody was involved in almost everything going into the new season. So it was important because we have such so you a function staff. more like a neural network where everybody's communicating with each other as opposed to a hierarchy, right? Yeah. We just, th that kind of hierarchy does not work. And we're a very, very small staff for what we pull off during the summer. And so it was really important that our, we 24 people year round staff. Right. And then of course we have about 450 seasonal employees for the summer, but um, it was really important because of those 24 people at any given time on any given show night, most of those people are going to be interacting with ticket buyers, donors, artists, all of the above or whatever. And so this started during COVID where, you know, everybody was craving for a, this is where we're going, or this is right. And this is wrong. like everybody was craving you know, certainty and black and white and all that kind of stuff. And so we worked really hard to cultivate a, you know, we're, we don't know what tomorrow will bring and we're just going to wake up and hopefully use beginner's mind to deal with what comes our way. And I think that during COVID, we all individually and as a staff learned some really important skills to just keep, a, you know, approaching every day as this kaleidoscope that's never, never the same. It's a very good. It's a very good point, right? If you're if you're going to be working under pressure, try and make it as fun and as interesting as possible because people are going through a lot. Uh, Lori, you you got a different situation in that uh, you're not doing. Um, um, this kind of jack of all trades approach, right? You've got a you you've got an infrastructure that is um, that is also a, a little bit more developed, and, and you are in a major urban uh, area. Are you also have you discovered a, a flattening approach or a neural network approach that 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 works for you in this time, or have you taken a different route? No, it very similar. But one thing that I I have found that's one of our biggest challenges right now is that 
you know, during the pandemic, while it was grueling, there was a ton of innovating happening. And, you know, we spent a lot of time with our team um, that we were able to retain thinking out of the box and really kind of just digging into who we can be, how is our mission serving in this time? And it was a lot of innovative thinking and then, you know, turned into action and, and, you know, a lot of virtual programming, all of that. Were the artists driving some of that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We did some really, just really incredible projects. And it it was coming from Chicago artists. We actually did a project with the Wallace, um, a a huge films project that was really engaging and, and we all learned a ton from, and it was pushing us. We were really spending this time being creative. And then as we rounded into planning for the reopening, we had to go right back into operating mode and we had to go back into getting all of our logistics in row and, and how do we welcome people back? And I think right now, one of the things that we're really wrestling with is, you know, building the capacity of team to be able to spend time almost like a research into, you know, R and D and, and really innovating and being creative while also taking the team that was responsible for running the operations and the day-to-day and logistics. And so, you know, we have a team as a team have, have tried to carve out time. Like this is a meeting where we're only talking about ideas and we're not going to, you know, just dive into logistics. But I do think as we look to the future to be able to maintain that type of exciting innovation, we're going to have to think about building out our teams and talent in, in a different way, in a different capacity and probably larger than, you know, Elizabeth, you mentioned small team. We have 30 full-time staff, 200 plus part-time is like, do we actually really need to think about expanding to really step into the realm of innovation for the future? And it's, it's, it's something I'm wrestling with a lot right now. In a sense, your portfolio of activity, Rachel, has, has expanded and your staff has to uh, now uh, consider what the lessons learned have, have provided in terms of a shift in how you operate. But you also have to operate, be ready to operate in a very traditionalist path. Has, has, has this uh, experience that you've had over the last period of time, has this uh, broadened the, the range of different approaches that you take to engaging audiences and working with, with artists? Or is this simply a, a blip in which your operating perspective um, hasn't really changed that much. You're just you're just continuing on with, with a great deal of continuity. Um, definitely not a blip. I think that our field and industry are forever changed. And like Lori, I'm just trying to figure it out. We're still stuck on remote. You know, who gets to work remotely? When your production team has to be in all the time, every day, and your development team doesn't, how, you know, that those issues of parity and, you know, we're also, we're a business that in my opinion relies so much on being in person and that teamwork. But, you know, the first question out of every candidate's mouth who is interviewing for a job, whether they are an associate or a senior director is, what is your work at home policy? Um, so I don't, you know, like I said, I'm still trying to figure it out. We're finding, trying to find the right balance and the right parity, but uh, no, it's not a blip. <laughs> I don't think we're going back. I think I think in that in that area, because we do so much recruiting across all these different sectors, including uh, your sectors, I think the big issue is finding people who care and are excited so much about the mission that they do what is rational. And then you give them as leaders, you give them the ability to do what actually serves the purpose. And if it's if it's remote, it's re- it's remote. If it's in person, it's in person. If it's a mix. It's a mix. And you giving your people the power to create the great performances on stage and the great experiences for audiences is just such a gift. It's a gift to us all. Lori Diamond, president and CEO of the Harris Theater in Millennium Park, Chicago. Rachel Fine, executive director and CEO of the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Los Angeles. And Elizabeth Sobel, president and CEO of the Saratoga Performing Arts Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. Thank you so much. This has been just a fantastic discussion. I know that it's just touching the the, the fringes. It's 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 the little part of the iceberg that peaks above this the surface. Please thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your artists, thank your audiences, thank your funders for the great work that you're doing, uh, and thank you so much for sharing 
your knowledge with us all.